Okay, let's start again. Thank you, and I welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for the public engagement session to discuss the Blue Prosperity Plan. This evening, our panelists will discuss how to grow our ocean-based industries while protecting, preserving, and managing our marine ecosystem, and the importance of providing your input and feedback to the consultative process. I would like to introduce our speakers, the Deputy Premier, the Minister of Home Affairs, the Honorable Walter Raban, JPMP, Ms. Shell Ann Mack, the Blue Economy Specialist, and from the Department of Environment and National Resources, Senior Marine Resources Officer, Dr. Tammy Warren. Again, thank you for coming, and we will begin our discussion with Minister Raban. Good evening, everyone. Very happy to see everybody here tonight uh, for this very, very important discussion that we're beginning with the country. Um, excited that this is the beginning of a process that we've always wanted to have where we include the public in this overall conversation. Because ultimately the plan one must reflect what the Bermudian community wants, but also want to make sure they know what has been included so that all questions can be answered and all concerns can be addressed. So good evening to everyone here at Centennial Hall. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. It's very important and this is something that's been, we've been all eager to start so that we can ensure that the Blue Prosperity Draft Plan is presented to the people of Bermuda. This is a plan for Bermuda, by Bermudians. But ultimately we need your input. We need your feedback for this plan to reflect what Bermuda and Bermudians want. And so this is a part of a process to hear from you, answer questions, and to give you information. As many of you know, we have a Bermuda plan, which is for the land. And that is designed to optimize our use, protection, and management of our land mass and also to build sustainable communities in Bermuda. So today, so today we proposed to have a similar concept for the ocean and move from what is 54 square kilometers of land and move that level of opportunity and that attention to 464,000 square kilometers, which is what we have as a marine environment which is Bermuda's. This is an area, as many of you don't know, is equivalent to eight, over 8,500 Bermudas. And so there is a tremendous opportunity to tap into economic growth, opportunities to develop infrastructure and job creation. The draft Blue Prosperity Plan outlines what we believe is a pathway to growing Bermuda's economy. It outlines specific goals and steps for developing the economy, attracting investors who will invest in Bermuda's ocean industries and provide a plan for managing and sustaining this natural environment and protecting it so that these industries, which will include sustainable fisheries, tourism, and renewable energy, can thrive. The Draft Blue Prosperity Plan was born out of the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Partnership, known as BOP, which has been community driven from its inception, with partnerships with the Government of Bermuda, Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, BIOS, and the Wake Institute. And since 2019, it has called upon consultation with Bermuda's industry experts government departments, marine scientists, ocean stakeholders to help develop the draft that we are presenting to you today. And now, once now that draft is finished, we're coming to you for your thoughts and feedback. The draft Blue Prosperity Plan has really two major components to it, which is the Blue Economy Strategy and the Marine Spatial Plan. Firstly, there is the Blue Economy Strategy, which is essentially a guideline for growing Bermuda's ocean-related industries and attracting the investment that will assist us with doing that. And then 
The other part is a marine spatial plan, which is a framework for the management and implementing sustainable ocean development, and also protections. And Ms. Mapp and Dr. Tammy Warren will talk to you more about the details of that. After this meeting, there will be two more public meetings. One will be held at BIOS in St. George's on the 21st of September, and the second one will be held at St. James's Church on the 28th in Sands. In addition, for those of you who don't like to come to meetings, you will be able to be a part of a number of processes that we are made to be ensure that we get as much community stakeholder feedback as we can. There are six stakeholder groups that we are creating so that all ocean users, users will have an opportunity to give feedback. There's also the Government Citizens Forum, which is forum.gov.bm, that will allow those of you who wish to fill out the survey to give your, your feedback, you can do so. Now, before moving to the next speaker, I just want to take a moment to commend the, the BOP team. This is a team of Bermudians, led by Bermudians, and many others. Because they have, for the past three years, been committed to this development of this plan and making a reality to the betterment of Bermuda, led by Bermudians for Bermudians. I cannot overstate how vital we believe this initiative is for the future of Bermuda. We have, to some degree, exhausted the maximum opportunities we have on land as a country. We are well-developed, well-managed, well-developed, but we only have 22 square miles. But this plan is an example of the possibilities we have for the future, and especially what we can do when we work together. Now, I appreciate there are some people who perhaps are skeptical of this plan and think this is too much, too much management, too much regulation, too much control being exerted over the oceans. And we understand that, because that's a view, and it's a view that people have a right to share and to have. So part of that process is to give you an opportunity to also be heard and to, and to not feel that you've been silenced, because everybody has an opportunity and should have an opportunity to have their say on this. But it's very important that we understand something as we go through this journey. If we do absolutely nothing to protect our ocean, to protect the critical, vulnerable species and habitats that are in the ocean around us, and we don't sustainably manage those resources, and ensure that we carefully consider the opportunities that we have, we'll lose it. And you know what we'll lose it to? climate change. We'll lose it to those out there who everybody knows, who scores the oceans, stealing and over-consuming ocean resources that aren't protected and properly managed. They sit on the edge of REEZ, fishing, letting their nets drop and drift into REEZ and taking our fish that we have yet to develop an industry to exploit ourselves in a proper way. There are others out there doing it now. And we don't have the capacity to stop them at this point. Climate change, overexploitation of the open waters, and just not pursuing or having a plan to develop these resources for our people, we will lose it because someone will be out there taking it. So the best thing we can do as a country is have a plan on how we're going to manage, how we're going to shape our opportunities, and how we're going to protect them as well. Because if we don't do that now, something else will affect them and they'll be gone for later. And generations after now will not have them. 
and then we'll be asking us why. Why did we not do something? This plan is us to do something, because if we do nothing, we'll end up like other parts of the world we know of, where these resources are stressed, they're not protected, and their people aren't benefiting from them. This is your ocean. This is your future. And this is an opportunity for you to decide what you wish to be done with them. So I welcome the opportunity for all of you who are here and others as we go through this journey to tell us what you think. We can hear what you say and we can factor that in to the decisions that will be ultimately made. And I hope you watch the presentations to come, listen to the speakers, and give us your feedback. Thank you very much. Genuinely, thank you for coming here and being a part of this conversation that we as Bermudians must have about our future. Thank you. has always been closely tied to the ocean, and our future depends on it. We rely on the ocean for our food, tourism, jobs, economy, and recreation. Our ocean is our biggest asset. What if we could combine responsible management of our ocean with financial support for sustainable ocean industries, such as marine tourism, commercial fishing, and renewable energy? The Blue Prosperity Plan is designed to do just that. Its development has been guided by the input of Bermudians throughout the process. Government agencies, ocean users, scientific experts, and members of the public. This is our plan, and it will help define Bermuda's future. If you haven't provided input yet, there's still time. The Blue Prosperity Plan is still in draft form, and we need your voice to help make a healthy ocean and thriving communities for Bermuda a reality. Let's dive in. The Blue Prosperity Plan has two components. The Blue Economy Strategy to sustainably grow jobs, industries, and investment in Bermuda. And the Marine Spatial Plan, a 10-year management plan to balance our island's ocean resources with the demands being placed on them. The goals of the Blue Economy Strategy are to facilitate sustainable fisheries, expand sustainable marine tourism, produce cleaner, cheaper energy, increase blue investment in Bermuda. The Blue Economy Strategy outlines the creation of an innovative funding mechanism to attract local and international investment into local businesses and marine protection programs. A successful blue economy needs a healthy ocean. In order to make the vision a reality, we need a way to manage our ocean. We call this a marine spatial plan provides guidelines for making decisions on what activities can take place in the ocean and where enhanced protection can support long-term sustainability. This will build upon existing zones and regulations, support new industries and job opportunities, and produce more local seafood. To make this plan, we needed to understand what resources the ocean currently provides. First, we use the best available science to look at what's in the ocean. There are seagrasses, coral reefs, fish populations, and Bermuda's shipwrecks. Then we took stock of how people use the ocean, such as for fishing, swimming and diving, boating, and shipping and transportation. All of this information has been layered together to create the Marine Spatial Plan. This plan helps decide how to sustainably use and manage our waters from the coastline, across the Bermuda platform, and extending 200 nautical miles from our shores. It also helps us find the best locations for fully protected areas to conserve important natural habitats, growing fish stocks, and implement our blue economy strategy. These two documents are intertwined and work together to design a pathway for a bright future in Bermuda. Here is our draft plan for the Bermuda platform with areas that are fully protected, highly protected, managed.
and our draft plan for Beyond the Bermuda Platform are waters extending out 200 nautical miles. We've been working with many of you on this draft plan for the past two years. We have early results, but we need your help refining the outcomes. We ask that you contribute to the future of our country and ensure that the Blue Prosperity Plan works for all Bermudians. Attend a public meeting, provide feedback online, or let your voice be heard now at BermudaOceanProsperity.org. Your ocean, your future, you decide. We now have a presentation from Bermuda has. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cheryl Mapp. I'm the Blue Economy Specialist with the Bermuda Ocean Prosperity Program, and thank you for your time taken um, to come out this evening. I will be presenting on the, blue, the work that's been done so far um, on the Blue Economy Strategy, which is um, one of two parts of the Blue Prosperity Plan. Uh, Dr. Tammy Warren will follow me with a presentation with respect to the second part of the plan, which is to discuss the Marine Spatial Plan. Uh, together, these two documents um, really depend on one another to be f for the plan to be successful. Uh, with both the Blue Economy Strategy, which focuses on the growth of Bermuda's marine resources, and then the Marine Spatial Plan, which focuses on the management of marine resources, this, the spaces that these industry rely on is very important. So thank you again for your time and attention this evening. What is the Blue Economy Strategy? And I'm sorry, I'm gonna be doing a bit of head uh, turning back and forth, so forgive me as we go along. Uh, Blue Economy Strategy is really a, as it says, a guideline for growing Bermuda's ocean related industries and attracting investment opportunities whilst also helping to maintain a healthy ocean. Uh, we've been developing the Blue Economy Strategy over the past 18 months. Uh, we've had extensive stakeholder consultations and we've been reviewing and we've been reviewing Bermuda's competitive advantages um, in this space. Uh, a particular focus uh, we've had here is with respect to three core industries, that is sustainable fisheries, tourism, and renewable energy. Um, the strategy that has been developed, and it, I have to emphasize that it is only in draft, um, provides a detailed explanation of how we reached the draft, and as I said, we were able to incorporate a lot of feedback from our industry consultation that we held with various stakeholder groups during the course of these past few months. The World Bank has, has, uh, I, has defined uh, the blue economy as being the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean ecosystems. Uh, without ocean protection, however, we cannot realize the benefits of the blue economy. So as I said when I started, really the marine spatial plan and the blue economy strategy go hand in hand in order for this uh, Blue Prosperity Plan to be successful. Uh, the ocean is capable of supporting sustainable economic growth for future generations, and I'd like to think of it and put it in a context of the ocean protection as being like a savings account that we have for the island of Bermuda. What is the uh, blue economy going to include? Uh, as I've, there's a potential areas to drive investment uh, to Bermuda with respect to these particular aspects that we've identified so far. This is not an exhaustive list, and that is why we're having the public consultation process now, uh, because we're seeking feedback um, from the general public as to any other areas that we may, uh, what we should be looking into. But sustainable tourism and fisheries, renewable energy, aquaculture, and biotech have really been the key areas that we thought would attract investment uh, to Bermuda and support our ocean economy. Uh, these have been our focus together with both uh, land uh, and ocean renewables. So we're looking at green and also blue uh, renewable options. 
During the course of our, our discussion period and development of the strategy, uh, we developed what are draft blue economy principles, and these are guiding principles that were formulated and approved by the BOP Steering Committee, um, which is a multi-agency um, um, committee uh, which has come together to help us to guide and shape the program. So the principles that uh, we have developed so far include the following, providing for current social and economic benefits for future generations, restoring and protecting marine ecosystems, providing evidence-based decision-making, having a multidisciplinary approach to diverse beneficiaries of ocean uses, and inclusive and transparent and, and an inclusive and transparent approach. And these um, principles so far have been the guidepost um, for the development of the strategy that we've presented so far. In conjunction with those principles, we've also developed these proposed goals. And these four goals include the facilitation of sustainable fisheries, an increase in blue investment in Bermuda, uh, the production of cleaner, cheaper energy, and the expansion of sustainable marine tourism. And in order to achieve this total vision, we really have looked at these goals. And one of the asks for this evening and during the course of these public consultations are whether or not the public has a view as to whether or not these principles and goals that we have proposed are correct. Do they need to be modified in some way? Um, do some need to be uh, added to, enhanced, etc.? So this is our ask for you during the course of this process. How do we achieve these goals that we've just set out? Um, we're looking at the, the development of what we are calling at the moment a blue investment facility. And this is going to be a means by which we drive finance and investment into local Bermudian businesses. The minister mentioned earlier that this program is a program that is being led by Bermudians for Bermudians to the benefit of Bermuda. And some of the elements that we have uh, discuss with respect to the, the Blue Investment Facility would be to get uh, multiple funding sources to be developing types of programs that are initially, um, one batch would be what we're calling an incubator program, which would allow for initial ideas of people wanting to test in, in a sandbox type of um, structure, different ideas they have in order to um, do businesses which fall within the categories that we've outlined for our goals and objectives. Another category would be investment-ready businesses. So they may be existing businesses that need additional capital in order to scale. And generally, the idea of, of this Blue Investment Fund is to really leverage Bermuda's um, uh, reputation within the international community to drive investment to make us uh, an, uh, a jurisdiction of choice for persons who want to look to um, promote the ocean uh, and the development and protection of its resources. So the structure with respect to how this blue investment facility is going to um, operate and the governance of it, et cetera, is what we will be working on in the coming months in order to have something that we can then um, announce to the public to say, this is what um, we've come up with, with the feedback that we're going to get through the consultation process. This is what we'll come up with um, to make it attractive to investment both locally and internationally. Uh, the governance with respect to what this structure will look like, as you said, it will drive finance in, into local Bermudian businesses. And we anticipate um, that we'd have probably likely three different types of funding sources, either through donors, through um, public um, funding, or private investors. So again, all of this right now are the drafts and the proposals with respect to the uh, blue investment uh, facility structure. And they, those donations will be channeled with set investment guidelines, which give strict uh, information as to what types of projects will fall within what we're calling the incubator program and what types of programs will fall within the investment ready or revenue generating types of businesses. But the, the crux of this would be in the link back with the marine spatial plan is that 
the investments that we are going to hope to attract um, through this facility will also, part of the investment will be used to support the marine protection areas as well. So we will have some measure, whether it's going to be um, some sort of a blue dividend. Um, we're not sure what the actual um, structure of that and the mechanics of that will be. But the whole purpose of the Blue Investment Facility is to provide opportunity for support of businesses, but also to support the marine protected areas through the, that will be defined through the MSP. Uh, again, much of this, and I want to emphasize that this is still um, in the thought process. We are developing this. This is nothing at the moment that is cast in stone. So we are looking for and invite feedback from the general public with respect to what you feel this blue investment facility um, should be and how you feel it should benefit local businesses because that's the core of the, the goal of the structure. The opportunities that will um, come from blue investment facilities, we will look to have businesses which meet the criteria which says that they benefit for Bermuda's oceans, communities, and sustainable livelihoods. Again, thinking about the goals and the principles that we have um, regarding the blue economy. There's potential for local revenue generation and returns on investment, as I've said earlier, in this form of this, um, what I'm calling a blue dividend or an investment return with respect to um, the confidence that investors will have in, in helping to support our ocean environment and alignment to priority sectors, that is fisheries, renewable energy, and sustainable tourism. And to this end, our research so far has identified approximately about 18 Bermudian projects that may be viable for potential investment. But we're continuing to do our due diligence in this regard and still looking for other projects. So again, um, the ask during the course of this public consultation process is if anyone has any types of projects that they think would be suitable to be considered for this uh, investment opportunity. These are things we'd like to hear back from you on. Uh, what we're finding, I guess I want to say a bit more here before I move on about the, the types of projects. What we are finding in the course of um, the work that we've done so far to develop the blue economy strategy is that most of the, the projects are in the incubator stage. There are a few that are investment ready or existing businesses that, as I said, are looking for additional capital to scale. But we're finding for the most part, it is incubator type programs that we're coming across. So much of our focus right now is going to be looking to see what is the best way in which we can encourage investment to support those uh, incubator programs. Uh, examples of some of the things that we've been looking at so far, and this is, again, this is merely examples and by no means an exhaustive list. Um, we've been looking at a project to deal with the Coral Garden Initiative, for instance, um, that would obviously benefit additional tourism revenue, um, provide coastal resilience, always trying to have the balance between looking at how we're supporting the marine environment and also providing business opportunities through um, the ocean and community solar renewable projects as well, again, with the goal to produce cleaner, um, cheaper energy. Um, that hopefully will be a, a godsend for most of us who are still suffering under the, 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 the fossil fuel emissions that we have through the current uh, energy resource that we have and uh, allow for climate um, mitigation. As the minister spoke earlier, we must do something to, to mitigate against climate change, and this will be one of the aspects that we can use to, one of the avenues we can use to address that. So at the end of the day, the bottom line most people come up with, so what's it got to do with me, and how does it affect me, et cetera. Uh, the blue economy strategy, how is that likely to impact on Bermuda? Well, first and foremost, we're looking to create new job opportunities to Bermuda. Um, enhance livelihoods, um, support businesses in Bermuda, drive investments um, to Bermuda to diversify the economy, and provide funding for ocean management. As again, marine protection is really the driver of sustainable blue economy 
development uh, because a healthy environment can only support and enhance uh, sustainable job, cre job creation and long-term benefits for future generations of Bermudians. Um, we have, you know, what we have here is unique. Uh, we have an ocean that deserves to be protected and enhanced to support our way of lives and it's closely linked to the ocean, which is our leisure activities, etc., and uh, the way in which we have positioned ourselves from an international business perspective, we should be able to provide an attractive option to those persons who want to invest in more sustainable types of projects and businesses. As far as timeline is concerned, uh, we're looking at having once approved, obviously, and the, the appropriate structure has been um, decided on and, and developed. We're looking over the, the next three years to design this incubator program that I mentioned, um, look at and review various projects um, with respect to the blue investment facility and refine what the investment guidelines and criteria will be for that. Um, go out and raise the money through business development um, for marine management, and then through the establishment of the Blue um, Investment Facility, bring those projects to investors so that real jobs can be created and, and real live, and persons' livelihoods um, can be enhanced, and opportunities for Bermudians can be further and diversified. Um, we're hoping that through the Blue Investment Facility, and this will create a more longer term um, opportunities for future generations of Bermudians. Um, we need to have your input, and that is something that you're going to hear over and over again during the course of these public um, consultation meetings and discussions. We need to hear from you. Um, we are presenting the information to you. The information is available through various forums on our website, etc. but we really need to hear from you. Um, as I said, the proposed goals um, and the blue economy priorities are to facilitate sustainable fisheries, increase blue investment in Bermuda, produce the cleaner and cheaper energy, and expand sustainable marine tourism. But we need to gather your feedback to know whether these we have it right. Do we have the right balance here with these goals? And so I really implore upon you, after this evening, during the course of the discussions, um, at the end of the presentations today, please give this some serious thought, because it's very important for us to be able to come back, gather the feedback, synthesize it, and be able to then come back to you after the fact with the findings of, of the consensus of the general population on these issues. Uh, again, if you know of a project um, that you think would be suitable for consideration of the Blue Investment Facility, again, if it falls within any of these four categories, you know, renewable energies or tourism or sustainable fisheries or aquaculture, please let us know. Um, and it could be at various stages of development. If it's just something, an idea that someone has, if it's something that someone is actually in the process of developing by way of a business, is it a business that has started and is just trying to get some traction in the, in the community and in the sector, or is it an operational business that really just needs additional capital to scale? These are the types of things that we're looking for to hear from the general population as to how we can help to support. Uh, and that will be through, as I said, this Blue Investment Facility. Um, so without any further ado, I think that's kind of all that I want to say at this stage. I'm very happy to discuss this further with you. Um, it is a work in progress, and as I said, this is a draft um, strategy that we've come up with so far, and uh, hopefully we'll get some additional feedback which will help us to refine this further. So thank you, and I will turn over to Dr. Warren, who will present to you Thank you, Ms. Plan. Thank you. And I meant to say all, earlier, thank you, uh, Minister Rodan, for your presentation as well. Dr. Warren, do you thank want to come to the podium or to stay there? Do you want to come to the podium or are you going to stay there? No, I'll stay You're here. Fine? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Cheryl. And um, good evening, everyone. So nice to see you all out this evening. Um, as Cheryl said, uh, the Blue Economy Strategy is the first part of the uh, Blue Prosperity Plan. 
And what I'm going to be presenting now in a little more detail is uh, the draft marine spatial plan. But first, I want to recap. Um, sorry. I want to recap the uh, blue economy strategy um, and what it's trying to achieve. So that is to facilitate sustainable fisheries, uh, expand sustainable tourism, produce cleaner, cheaper energy, and increase blue investment in Bermuda. But in order to do this, we need to look after Bermuda's marine resources so that we have the natural capital available to attract investment and grow the economy. For example, we need healthy fish populations to sustain our fishing industry and also uh, blue tourism. Um, and we're looking to do that through marine spatial planning. So the blue economy strategy, as you've already heard, and the marine spatial plan are intricately linked and create what we are calling the blue prosperity plan. But why is government adopting marine spatial planning or ocean planning as it's also called? Um, well, studies have shown that this method of resource protection can balance human uses and nature, reduce user conflict, improve ecosystem health, manage and conserve marine resources, preserve marine heritage, improve livelihoods, and enable sustainable development. And all of these benefits lead to a thriving blue economy. The components in our draft marine spatial plan, the major components are firstly the principles, goals, and objectives. And these include objectives for mapping and management. The maps outline where protected areas are proposed, and the management objectives help to address challenges relating to management, monitoring, enforcement, and public outreach. Next are the potential use areas. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Next are the potential use areas. Uh, these have been split up into potential areas for renewable energy, and potential areas for habitat restoration. And then there is the proposed marine protected area network. These are intended to be managed alongside currently legislated areas and will enable the government to achieve its commitment of fully protecting 20% of the exclusive economic zone. And this is the area from shore out 200 nautical miles at sea. The principles, goals, and objectives have helped to shape the current draft marine spatial plan. And as a dynamic living document, they will continue to shape the plan going forward. They can be split into the following broad categories, and you can see them on the screen, include ocean health, sustainable fisheries, renewable energy, marine heritage, infrastructure, tourism, enforcement, scientific research, and education and outreach. Some of the um, examples of the management of objectives include um, the, um, focus on em enforcement strategy um, and also licensing structure that will able, allow us to be, um, better monitor catches and also a legal framework um, for regulating and managing activities and development. The Bermuda government has already drafted a marine enforcement strategy and is working with the UK government through the Blue Shield program and the US Coast Guard to improve enforcement and compliance of current marine resources regulations. And this will obviously extend to the new regulations and protected areas. The draft marine spatial plan includes a full monitoring proposal to assess the effectiveness of the proposed marine protected areas and to assess fisheries across the platform. It, would also, it will also assess the response of the environment and the tourism sector to the applied protection. And the marine spatial plan also makes it a requirement for development proposals and certain activities to require a full environmental impact assessment before development approval is granted. 
Now we'll talk about the potential use areas. So as I said, we're looking at um, development areas for renewable energy, and that includes offshore wind, uh, wave energy, and floating solar. Uh, these are not going to be legal maps. Um, they are descriptive maps that are meant to aid developers and land managers in the decision-making process. So the potential development areas can provide initial guidance in the planning process for the best places to develop renewable energy in relation to environmental constraints and minimizing ocean user conflict. And the potential conservation area maps show areas with special environmental significance in relation to habitat restoration. They show where restoration projects might be viable. So here's an example of um, some of the potential use area maps. So on the left are potential suitable areas for renewable energy development for the different energy sectors. And the red areas is equal most suitable areas and the yellow areas are less suitable. Various criteria have been applied to exclude areas for renewable energy development such as shipping lanes, airport control area, and the most valuable coal and seagrass habitat. Other factors such as fishing value, coral cover, and coral diversity have been used to create an index of suitability. On the right, you'll see an example of the habitat restoration map showing areas that are most suitable for mangrove restoration using the same color scheme. The Marine Spatial Plan also shows maps suitable for seagrass and coral restoration and criteria was applied to create this index of suitability, such as substrate type, proximity to existing habitat, vulnerability to sea level rise, and many more. So now we'll get to the part which I'm sure m many of you have come for, the uh, Marine Protected Areas Network. So on this side, you see the proposed protected areas for the offshore areas. Protection levels are in accordance with criteria set out in the Marine Protected Area Guide, which is a science-based tool and framework to identify different types of marine protected areas. The green areas show where full protection is proposed and therefore no extractive activities would be allowed, such as development, fishing, dumping, extractive research, or mining. Uh, the proposed uh, marine, sorry, the orange areas, sorry, the orange areas show where high protection is proposed and where some extractive activities would be allowed. And the yellow lightly protected area covers the entire exclusive economic zone and shows where some protection exists and moderate extraction is allowed. And it recognizes the laws and management currently in place. So the proposed marine protected areas cover a variety of different habitats. Under the sea, there are mountains, hills, cliffs, and plains. And just like on land, you would expect to find different species living in these different habitats. So by protecting a wide variety of different habitats, we would also be protecting a wide variety of different species. The proposal also attempts to reduce user conflict by avoiding high use fishing areas. So you can see, you might not be able to see where it says A3, but I know you know, many of you know where Crescent is. Um, so this is an underwater mountain or sea mount as they're commonly called, that is often used by um, the current longliner. As a sea mount, it is a valuable habitat and so has been proposed for high protection while also allowing for small scale sustainable fishing of tunas and similar species which are important for Bermuda's fishing industry. Seamounts are known to be hot spots of biodiversity, and the ocean currents hit the seamounts and cause upwellings, which, can, which bring up the nutrients from the ocean floor and attract lots of different species. Bermuda has good maps on its seamounts compared to many other countries. And in the exclusive economic zone, there is also a variety of other habitats and the offshore protected area proposal aims to protect not only different habitats, 
but also different depth zones to conserve a wider variety of species. So now for the nearshore MPAs. So this shows, this slide shows the newly proposed marine protected areas for the near shore alongside Bermuda's currently legislated areas. The new protected areas are meant to bolster the current designations and better protect ocean resources. Marine protected areas are one tool among many to achieve this increased protection. Other tools include implementing the management objectives that we looked at earlier, such as improved enforcement, licensing structures, monitoring, education, and outreach. As with the offshore proposal, the green areas on this map show where all extractive activities would be prohibited, while the orange areas prohibit certain activities in order to achieve the stated objectives for that particular area, while minimizing user conflict. Marine protected areas are spread evenly across the platform to account for different environmental conditions that might affect marine organisms and human uses. As a result, it is thought that the network will have more resilience against environmental stressors. Also, the impact on ocean users is more evenly spread across the reef platform. The areas proposed for full protection incorporate representative areas from a variety of habitat types, therefore protecting a variety of species. Again, it takes a stepping stone approach to habitat connectivity and species dispersal. So key habitats are given full or high protection, which provides refuge areas for fish during the different life stages. Proposed marine protected areas incorporate some of Bermuda's densest and most diverse coral areas. The network also incorporates areas with high fish diversity and abundance. This has been considered holistically, accounting for all of Bermuda's fish species and also specifically for commercially important fish species. The proposed marine protected areas also incorporate areas that will increase the chances of young fish reaching adulthood and improve breeding opportunities, which will bolster fish recruitment. Also included are the seasonally protected areas that are spawning sites for some commercially important group of species. The proposed marine protected areas also incorporate many of Bermuda's historic wrecks protecting historical and cultural heritage. This not only provides artificial reefs for marine life, but also protects area important to various sectors of the blue economy. And the proposed area, marine protected areas incorporate important nursery habitat, including seagrass, mangroves, and nursery patch reef. Almost 90% of the best seagrass sites are incorporated in this proposed network in either fully or highly protected areas. The Marine Spatial Plan also includes a proposed coastal protection plan in which all established mangrove habitat is given full protection with a 10 meter buffer and a 50 meter no fishing buffer. Mangroves are not only important nursery habitat, but also provide shoreline protection against erosion and adverse weather conditions. Other parts of the proposed coastal plan include increased protection in key bays and coastal areas to protect important bait fish areas and nursery habitat. So the next slide here um, aims to show the difference between the proposed highly protected areas and summarizes which activities would be prohibited in each area. So fully protected areas, again, will protect the most vulnerable areas and will prohibit all extractive activities. The pelagic zones um, offer protection of the seabed and would prohibit activities that directly damage corals and other valuable habitat on the bottom of the ocean while permitting fishing for tunas and other surface species. Seasonal closure areas are important for commercial fish species and fishing restrictions at certain times of the year would be maintained and all types of development would be prohibited. 
and the lobster reservoir currently prohibits lobster trapping and would now also prohibit dredging and renewable energy development. The proposed area, protected area network also tries to minimize user conflict by avoiding high use areas as identified by an ocean use survey that asks stakeholders to indicate how they value the ocean space. The Marine Spatial Plan includes a comprehensive user impact assessment to compare impacts of newly proposed marine protected areas with what exists under current legislation. As much of the local fishing happens in the demersal fishing area or bottom fishing area, impacts were measured in this area specifically as well as in the wider nearshore area. So finally, I just want to make it clear um, with regards to the fully protected areas, uh, the majority of Bermuda's waters would still be open to fishing with the draft marine spatial plan. Um, this was developed with input from fishers and was designed to minimize impact to fishers. In the near shore area, 3.8% of these waters, so that would include the uh, banks, um, would be full no-take areas, but the banks are not included as a full take protected area as you would have seen in earlier slides. Um, on the Bermuda platform, um, so zero to 55 meters deep, 10.1% of the Bermuda platform would be in full no-take areas. But I want to stress that this is a draft marine spatial plan, as you heard Cheryl say and as you heard the minister say. These are draft plans, so please Please do not take this as a done deal, and please give us your feedback. We encourage you to give feedback through one or more of the three methods that are available. You are here tonight, so you can provide that feedback now, or you can give more in-depth feedback through one of our stakeholder Ocean Village group. I see a number of fishermen here, and I don't know if all of you have signed up for the commercial fishermen um, Ocean Village group, but you can give your feedback um, in more detail in that group. So I encourage you to join. And you can also give feedback online on the Bermuda Citizens Forum. Um, there are also other, two other public meetings planned in St. George's and Somerset. And so if you, you um, don't see you know, your friend here or, or a colleague or um, whoever you want to tell to come to these meetings, um, please encourage them to come to St. George's or Somerset to give feedback. So I just want to briefly um, say what will happen after this consultation period. So all of your feedback will be reviewed in a structured way and considered by the BOP Steering Committee. And if approved by the Steering Committee, the feedback will be incorporated into the final draft Blue Prosperity Plan. And then this final draft will then return to the public. Legal adoption of the plan is expected in, in 2023 but a, a tra transition period is anticipated for implementation of newly legislated marine protected areas as identified in the final adopted marine spatial plan. So I thank you for listening, and I think now we're gonna take questions. Again, this is your ocean, your future, and you get to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren, thank you. So it's 10 after, and we will now take questions for the next 30 minutes, and I will remind you uh, that each person is afforded one question, and each question has a maximum of one minute and 30 seconds. That way, hopefully, everybody will get a chance. Uh, please use any of the three mics, and if you do not want to get up and ask a question, if you prefer to write it down, Paulo, standing there, has cards and pens, and he is happy to bring them to you. Just raise your hand. So I see we have... No? Oh, <laughs> that's not technical. Does anyone want to ask a question? Oh, thank you, Danny. Yeah, I, uh, thank you all for the um, presentations tonight. Uh, I think everybody did a great job. I'm glad to hear that you're open for discussion and comment, and this is not set in stone. I, I was, however, taken back 
by the comment, by the minister, that this is a Bermudian solution. This also included Wake Foundation. And I can tell you by being on the steering committee, I butted heads mostly with them than with the local group here on that. But, you know, I represent the fishermen. I represented the CFC, part of your board, on the steering committee. My concern is this. Bermuda is struggling now in many ways. Our cost of living is skyrocketing. Our fishermen are not exempt to that. We have some bait fishermen here tonight that this whole, if it goes through, is seriously going to impact them. Um, we are looking at developing the FDC to grow our industry, so I'm glad to hear that the minister supports that. But we have fishermen, we have 100 licenses and about 300 fishermen. They are in the bottom third of the employment survey. Now, if we don't do this correctly, you're going to take money out of their pockets. So we need to be conscious of that, and we need to work together to build solutions that will be best for Bermuda. Is that a minute and 30? Do you have a question? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, get, I get one more? We'll give you some more time to ask a question. I, get one more. I have an original question. <laughs> I have an original question tonight that I want to direct to the minister again. Uh, my major concern with this whole process is the signing of the MOU. Okay? The signing of the MOU. This was done, and I think consultation should have taken place at that point. But the government went ahead and gave away 20%. And now we have this. Why wasn't there public consultation at that point? The cake is already... In this case, the cake has already been taken out of the oven and we're putting icing on it. The time for public consultation was when you signed that MOU. Thank you. Thank you for the question um, and the comments I also will address. Um, the final decisions on anything that's been put together will be by Bermudians. The Wade Foundation personnel that you've been dealing with have helped to facilitate the process. That was their role. But this has been driven by Bermudians. Most of the Bob Steering Committee are Bermudians. Different groups that I mentioned, that is who they are. This is led, the decisions will be made by Bermudians on this. Wade is, has, Wade is a facilitator. They brought resources available to us to facilitate a process, which they have facilitated all around the world. So they're not the ones driving this process. It is us. That's in the beginning. That's the, I as the government leader of this, that's how it operates, and that's how I expect it to operate, and that's how I know it has operated. The other point is about the 20 percent. The 20 percent commitment was made because that is a part of the process that we are a part of globally. All around the world, jurisdictions are making decisions about protected areas. The actual goal and objective that we were presented with was 30 percent. We didn't agree to that. And part of the reason we didn't agree to it because we understood the interests, particularly of our fishermen and others. We're a small island. And the impacts of having that done, and if you go around the world, every jurisdiction, some are committing to even higher than 30 percent. We weren't prepared to do that. We agreed to 20 percent, and that's still, even though, even though weight aspires for its partners to do that, we came to agreement around 20 percent. And we ultimately, as the government of Bermuda, signed an MOU. MOUs are agreements that aren't legal. They are 
a commitment that you make. So ultimately, it will be for the government to, at the end of the day, enshrine the 20%. And we agreed to it because we believe that was reasonable to, um, we are committed to this process of balancing protection with opportunity for our fisheries, which we believe in the long term will be good for Bermuda. And ultimately, it will be the government to ensure that happens. No one else can actually do that. It is governments that actually the ones that ultimately are ensuring from a legal standpoint that whatever happens in enforcement, whatever happens in management, whatever happens in conservation with our partners happens. So the 20% we believe is reasonable. We could have not done that and then you might face having 30% imposed. That could happen. The British government could impose the 30% on us. Now would you have preferred that to happen or would you prefer your government to actually commit to a reasonable percentage that we know that w would be a reasonable commitment. At the same time, we, we create an overall strategy, which we're doing, to um, ensure a sustainable future. Because if we did nothing, the 30% or more, and there's some other jurisdictions that they've committed to even higher numbers, or um, because their relationship with even the UK government is different. They've had to, they've, they have committed to higher numbers. We weren't prepared to do that. So the 20% so, so the was a part of a balanced approach. And I think we all know that ultimately, um, no one gets everything in these processes of when you, when you do certain things. Those who wanted us to commit to 30% didn't get all that they wanted. So, and we, not everything that we may want in this, all of us in this process are going to get everything that we want. But ultimately, we believe that we can pursue a balanced approach, a balanced objective that will be sustainable for the country and that everybody can participate in. 20%. But at the end of the day, 80% is open to opportunity. 80% of our EEZ is open to everyone who wants to pursue the opportunity to take advantage of the fisheries opportunities that will come. This plan is about expanding fisheries, not limiting it, and bringing the investment and the will to take advantage of that and to help those Bermudians who wish to take advantage. We'll have 80% of our EEZ available to potentially create local markets of additional fishing resources, but also potentially even export. That is the opportunities that we potentially can develop as a community if we have a plan. This is the draft. The draft needs your contribution. So I appreciate the concerns about some of these issues, but going back to the core question, Bob is Bermudian-led. BARP is Bermudian driven. Of course we have partners. Wade is a partner, along with BIOS, along with the government. We have partners. We're relying on scientific expertise, local, primarily, because it's primarily our local scientists that have driven the data around this. And of course, international, because we always have partners. But m the elements that have this been put together are Bermudian driven, are Bermudian led, and the decisions ultimately will be by Bermudians as to what happens. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. You want to go that one? Uh, this one? Either one. I'm, <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm a commercial bait fisherman from St. George's. And back in 1999, I wrote to Dr. Warren and identified all the bays that were protected all the bays that are unfishable because of moorings, sunken boats, and damage. And she has that letter. Since then, the situation has only gotten worse. More moorings, more sunken boats, more trash around, less places we can fish. Now you're proposing to take the few remaining places that you can haul bait completely away and put, put myself, my nephew, out of business. <clears throat> for what? 
mangroves, nets aren't damaging mangroves. Do you, do you want to make all that protected? I'll tell you what's damaging mangroves. Coming in ferry reaches, bias boat ship two and three times a week, stirring up mud from Swing Bridge to the prison farm every time it moves. That's one reason. Then you got to look at all the other areas. There's very limited bait fishing, and you're going to you're going to wipe it out. So what are you going to do? Buy us out? I don't want to be bought out. I want to continue fishing. And you know, this you you don't pay attention to what the fishermen tell you. I've taken you out in the boat and showed you the beds of fry. This year, there's more fry in Bailey's Bay, Ferry Reach than there's ever been. And why? Because we didn't have cruise ships because of COVID. That's why. And But you guys can't figure it out. You don't know that the fry comes in and goes out every day. You think it stays there all the time. So, you know, you need help from fishermen. And you need to look at this and eliminate that. You do not need more protected areas than what you already have. The prob problem is you can't enforce what you have. That's, that's what the issue is. All the areas that should be enforced are not enforced. And you're not going to enforce the rest of this. You want to stop everybody from fishing off the rocks in these no-take zones, cast nets, everything. That's what you're trying to do. Now look, look at Bailey's Bay where you pass every single day. That bay up there below the cricket club between the pylons and shore was a highly productive bay. It's been completely destroyed by that dredge up there laying the cables for Belco. Take a look at that. Look at it. It's disgraceful. Okay. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we've gone over time. Did you? Yeah, fine. Yeah. I'm apologies, fine. but we've gone over time. Um, Dr. Warren, or does anyone on the panel wish to respond? Did any of you want to respond to his comments? <laughs> Um, the mangrove protection is, is part of a uh, policy of the ministry in order to um, increase um, protection really from development. Um, but there are also important nursery habitats, um, and there is concern about um, you know, taking other species in that. No, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> sir, sir, yeah. still interrupt. Let, yeah. let, you, know, you were given the respect to have your presentation. Let, um, let the doctor do so. Yeah. We should respect each other's ability to speak. That would be good. And you have to understand also that this is not my plan. This is a plan that was made up with consultation with many different stakeholders. So it's not my plan, it's your plan. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Do you have a question? You wanna to come to the mic, please? Do not tell me 
Mr. Minister, that you, we have to give up 30%. You may not have done right now, but you failed to tell us what on or what country has given up. I'm sorry, excuse me, sir. Excuse? Do, do you have a question? Because within the interest of time, there are other people who have... These guys have used to have four times as much time as I have. Okay. I'll be able to work better. Okay. Um, right now, you have a lot of big face on the dollar that's bad. Um, high run, five year ban, 32 years ago. Um, the snapper ban, five years ago. Charter ban, five year ban, 30, um, 32 years ago. It's all a ban, you can't cross it. This to me smells like a dumb deal. You say green, you say green. You ever heard of land grab, which your government's defending? This is ocean grab. You sell us out, your government, our government, they sell us out to farms. You say it's local, I dispute. I'll stand by that and fight your way. It's a bunch of rich whites coming here from the United States of America, Blue Halo, that's trying to sell us. This group they got them 10 years ago, now they're coming under you. Our goal is selling us down to you. I'll defend it, and when it gets most of the time, when this becomes reality, I'll defend it even worse. You're going to put a lot of guys, I'll do this again. Okay, thank you. And thank no you. Reason for it. And if you, or one question I have to you, Mr. Minister, you tell me, or tell us, what are the Caribbean in the world that's already given up 20 or 30 cents? Okay. That ocean goes for all of us. Your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, leave alone. Our fishing is great. We do not need no more protection. You got protection right now, and you cannot protect Okay, all right. Let me just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I understand your passion. I understand your passion. I just want to you know, please just want to draw your attention to that we have these guidelines in place so that more people can have an opportunity to speak. Um, Minister, did you want to respond to him? No? Okay. Thank you. Who, there was another gentleman who had a question. Oh. Uh, Minister, respond to the question of what other country has given up more than 30%. You must have the data. You said it's got to have the data. Okay. Sorry. All of the overseas territories have all given up 30% or more. All of the overseas territories have given up 30% or more. Azores, more than 30%. Places like um, Tristan da Cunha, almost 100%. Those are the territories. Other ocean communities like ours have given up more. Some are under 100% management. That is what's happened. We would never have agreed to that, ultimately, as Sir, sir, um, you asked for an answer to the question. You must be respectful. You were given an opportunity to ask a question. We're not going to have that here. I've answered the question, but I'm also sensitive to the concern. This is not blue here. One of the things we told the Wayne Foundation when they came here, we're not having Blue Halo again. They came here and frankly disrespected, we feel, the fishing community. So we clearly told them, no Blue Halo ever again. This is not Blue Halo. That's why we're here talking to you. This is not the side of Mr. Barnes. I appreciate your concerns. But I also would ask people to not attach themselves just to their fears or the myths. I've had people tell me that we've sold off the ocean to the British. How do I do that? How do I sell off our ocean? Somebody needs to explain that to me. We are not in the business of trying to give away the future of this country. We want to work with you. We understand the concerns about these issues. And that's fine. That can be part of the ongoing conversation about bait fishing and how that's done. But we have to do things to protect. Protection, reasonable protection, will ensure long-term prosperity. I want more fishermen in this country. I'm not trying to get rid of the fishermen. I want more. I want more fishermen. I want more fishermen who will be able to embrace investment so they can fish further out, who can fish in a way that is embracing the new technologies, new methods, that they'll have our support. That's what I want. But this plan is not in stone. This plan is here to hear from you. I commit to that. And I commit to that. At the end of the day, if, I don't, if I'm not satisfied that's happened, nothing will go forward. And that's the truth. But, I'm, but I am committed to a future where we have sustainable fisheries, 
We have more fishermen fishing in a way that is profitable to the country, that grows the economy and grows opportunity for those who wish to be in the business. I'm not trying to be direct here, but many fishermen are up in age because there aren't a lot of young people coming into the industry. How do we create a industry where young, young communities who don't want to be reinsurers, don't want to be underwriters, don't want to be lawyers, we have to ensure that there are pathways for them and they can see economic opportunities that even some of you can perhaps develop them into, who can be their stewards. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see people go out, but I'm also here to hear your fears so that we can address them. That's why we are here. But I'm not going any further. It's not my interest in going any further than what we committed to. But still, what we've committed to can be shaped by you. That's why we're here. That's why we're going through this process. And you will see what ultimately you have told us. We will give it back to you to look at, to make sure that you see what you have contributed. That's, a part of, that's why this process is like this. Maybe past governments just did things and they didn't tell you. We're trying to take a different approach. And that means hearing the criticisms as well as the compliments from you. So I ask you to allow us to go through this process together. And, I, and, if, you, and if you feel still that it's not fine, I'll, I'll, I will still listen to you. The government will still listen to you. Because we don't, our interest is, is ensuring that we have a fishing industry for the long term. So that your children can consider fishing an opportunity. Potentially to build an export industry, if that is the will of those who want to be in the industry. Not just content to sell locally and supporting the investment that goes into that, but also the training and everything else. The investment that we're trying to develop for the Blue Economy will also aid in training. And perhaps training that would be to the standards that you feel is necessary for people who want to enter the industry. So people just don't enter the industry. We also want to, yes, manage the um, people who fish off the rocks too, because we know they have an impact on the availability of fish commercially. And that's an issue that you fishermen have concerns about. Thank you. That's why I work with people smarter than me. Okay? Albania, Angola, Antigua, Armenia, Australia, Bangladesh, Barbados, Belgium, Belize, Benin. I can go on because it's really an A to Z list. Multitudes of countries that have committed to more than 30%. The UK does its own thing. We must do what's for ourselves. But understand something. The UK could impose on us too. And we're, and we're working to avoid that. Yes, they can. Legally, they can, sir. Believe me, they can. Sir, they can. They could impose higher percentages of protections in our EEZ. Sir, let's stick to the topic at hand here. They could impose higher restrictions on our EEZ if we don't manage it ourselves. That right now is the law, because the EEZ is under their legal remit right now, until we make some other changes. So these are some of the things we're doing to ensure to protect our long-term interests, so no one imposes anything on us. That is reality. I have nothing to hide here. So I'm, I'm prepared to tell you everything that is necessary for us to do what we have to do. I have nothing to hide. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We have five minutes, five minutes left. And Th uh, thank you, thank you, Minister, for coming up and stating that. Uh, it's good to know what we do. the feedback we give tonight will be taken into consideration. So that's a positive step. My only question is: Do I have to deal with these way people? Anymore? Are they going to show up in the steering committee when we have? Yeah, yeah, debates and things about this, or are we going to do it as a Bermudian solution? Okay, and that's going in here. Go ahead. Um, I probably don't need a microphone either. Um, I just like, don't disagree with 20%. I mean, that's the most reasonable number. Uh, sadly, it's the area where Bermudian fishermen, people, persons, Men, fish. You're taking away livelihoods. And for you to stand there and say you want young people to go into the fishing industry and they've got some miraculous amount of money 
shed rate, all of those days have been closed off the commission for years, 20 plus years. Go there, have a walk around tomorrow, and have a walk around the other days that have been fished, you won't see any difference. The mangroves have been damaged the same, the sea pits have been damaged the same. No difference. Fishermen have not damaged the environment. Suggest that as we go forward, and we um, we're, uh, we've got the uh, further consultation with, uh, with groups, that you join those conversations and have that conversation. Bring it to our light. This is a draft plan, so there is opportunity to get your point across and have that discussion in a focus group. So my suggestion is that please engage, have a conversation, and your compatriot. Um, sorry, I don't know your name, sir. But um, you, if you have a point to make, let's have that discussion. And that's all I've got to say at this point. Um, it, that's just the one. Sure, and, but that's fine. And it's very difficult in a town hall meeting to get all those points addressed. Uh, it, well, that's fine. So we, we will have time. Um, so my point is here, let's engage. Let's have those discussions. This is a draft plan that was primarily led in the fishing section by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, not the way so I've got to make that very clear. It is being developed by local, so, and by our own local tech, um, technical officers. So, we will lay the blame. It's, it's on this end of the table. So, um, please, let's have a discussion. Thank you, Dr. Pettit. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I do welcome, I mean, or invite the Minister of Safety and Police before we leave. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming up. I want to thank everybody who's come here for everybody who shared. This is not a meant to be a conversation that uh, ends here. It's part of a process. And I want for all of you who are here, no matter what your feelings are, to contribute to the discussion, become a part of it, because it's your contributions that will shape whatever we do. There are some things that you've seen that will change, but it's only going to change if we know what your views are on them. But not doing nothing will not get us forward. And participating in the process is doing something. And you constructively contribute to where we ultimately end up. So all your contributions here are valuable, irrespective of your views of what you've seen, because it will continue to shape if you become a part of the process. And I thank you for coming. I look forward to the further the journey with you. Our people are here to engage. If you wish even to write um, comments to me directly, whroban at gov.bm. You may write me at the uh, ministry and the government if you wish to just deal with me. But there are processes that our people have said. You can go online. You can go to forum.gov.bm. You can share your views. Because it's essential that your voice is heard in this process. Positive or negative, it shapes. Everything shapes where we will go, because this is about a Bermudian solution. It is not a foreign solution. It will never be a foreign solution. I'm committed to a Bermudian solution, a Bermudian plan, 100%. Thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing you at the next opportunity, which I believe is the 21st at BIOS in St. George's. Next Wednesday in St. George's. You may come there, but please, Engage with us, participate, so we can all come to a Bermudian solution together. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi.